Hi, uh, my name is Brendan Scott and I'm the historian in residence uh, at Cavan County Council uh, for this decade of Centenaries programme. And this evening's talk uh, is a really interesting one uh, and it, it deals basically with material from an archive uh, which was uh, donated to uh, the Cavan Library Service by Frankie Dolphin, who was the son of Frank Dolphin uh, uh, from Ballyconnell. And uh, it, it gives a great amount of information about um, uh, the revolutionary years, I suppose, in West Cavan. Um, and Cavan County Council and the Library Service and myself as well would really like to acknowledge the support of Frank's son, Frankie, uh, who collected uh, this material, put it together, and whose generosity made uh, this archive possible. And we are going to be having uh, an exhibition of material from the uh, archive later on this year so keep an eye out for that as well uh, while you're at it. Now this gentleman here is uh, Francis Joseph Dolphin, known as Frank uh, he was born on the 10th of July 1898 and baptised two days later, the son of James Dolphin and Angela uh, whose maiden name was Clancy he was raised in Ballyconnell uh, where his family owned a hotel which is I think around where the Crow's Nest is now in Ballyconnell uh, Frank became the intelligence officer for the West Cavan IRA uh, Curlew Battalion. Uh, before his death on the 2nd of September 1964, Frank had collected an enormous archive of material relating to the revolutionary period in West Cavan, which, as I said a moment ago, his son Frankie uh, has compiled and generously donated to the Cavan Library Service. Uh, the, 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 the pieces that I've selected to discuss this evening uh, make up, <clears throat> excuse me, make up a very small part uh, of this extremely important archive of material. And for more information on Frank and on the situation in West Cavan during the revolutionary period, I recommend that you read his memoir, which was in a book that I edited and which came out last year called uh, County Cavan and the Revolutionary Years 1918-22. You're able to get uh, copies of that through the library service in Cavan. <clears throat> so, the first real uh, image that, that we're discussing is this ticket uh, for a Sinn Féin fundraising event in Ballyconnell, which was held in the town hall on the 27th of December 1917. Two attempts had been made to form a Sinn Féin branch in Ballyconnell, firstly in June 1917, and a more successful attempt the following month in July that year. A second branch was also founded in Kildallan at the other end of the parish. Sinn Féin held a public demonstration in Ballyconnell on the 17th of August 1917, at which speakers included Arthur Griffith, uh, the founder of Sinn Féin. So this show that, that this ticket is for, which was held just after Christmas in the year that the Ballyconnell Sinn Féin Club was founded, was an important fundraiser which would also raise public awareness of the movement in West Cavan. The Republican themes of the drama also tied in with the club's aspirations. But they're also trying to cover as many bases as possible uh, with um, uh, the the uh, talk of a very laughable Irish farce. Uh, and they also have Irish step dancing and singing and recitations. So they're trying to get as hit as many bases and cover as many interests as possible to get people to come out. And you'll see that uh, listed as one of the secretaries is uh, Frank Dolphin himself, who signs himself as there at the bottom right uh, corner. Now, this is a hand-drawn map of the area, which uh, was covered by the West Cavan Curlew Battalion, and it takes in the towns and villages of Belturbet, Milltown, Ballycommon, Bomboy, and so on and Bar. It's a very, very detailed map, which takes in the road, rail, and river networks, taking a special note of bridges and hills on roads, which could be used as defensive points uh, or uh, ambush points as well. Uh, the rivers and mountain ranges are named as well. You can see Quilka and Slave Russell and all those places there too. Um, the boundary ends in Glen Gap, as you can see coming out there. The blue line is is the boundary. Uh, and although it's marked on the map as well, the towns of Kilachandra and Balnamore, obviously Balnamore is in County Leitrim, uh, they were outside the purview of the Curlew Battalion, but they marked them in anyway. Uh, it also points out the roads to Enniskillen, Clonus, Calvin Town and Black Lion, which are themselves not marked on the map. It's also subdivided into smaller sections, uh, which the letters uh, uh, signify, uh, the letters are A to I. And it's a really useful working map and indicates, I suppose, the level of detail and professionalism, which was apparent in this particular uh, battalion. 
Now, this image is a list of houses in the area defined by that map that we just saw a moment ago. And it also, uh, these were houses, they were safe houses really, but they also doubled as hospitals if required. And the letters, as I say, relate to those that were on that map that we just looked at. Uh, for example, the F Company Hospital uh, is the house owned by Thomas Fitzpatrick of Kilnaglar, which is just outside Milltown, and which is marked as such on that map. Uh, we just saw. The support of locals uh, was really important to the IRA at this time. And this list of properties, as I say, which were not only hospitals, but probably safe houses as, as well, uh, this list of properties demonstrates that very clearly. Now, in 1917, as a means of bypassing the British legal system, parish arbitration courts were established in County Cavan. And some of these courts in Ballyconnell were held in a granary or in a loft owned by the Drum family. Uh, these were replaced later on by the Dahl Courts in June 1920. And this uh, particular slide shows the oath of, of allegiance, which arbitrators, in this case, Thomas O'Reilly, who's a prominent Sinn Féin member in the area, uh, were to take. And the Dolphin Archive also contains notes on some of the cases held uh, in the Ballyconnell Courts. And I myself gave a talk, a short talk, a few weeks ago uh, about the Drumlane Courts. So uh, the, the library has managed to amass quite a nice um, uh, amount of uh, original sources to do with the arbitration and doll courts in Ballycon and in Drumlane. And this is a letter from Charles Dolan of Curava in Glengevelin to Frank Dolphin in his capacity uh, of Secretary of the Ballycon Sinn Féin Club. And it's dated the 12th of August, uh, 1919. Frank had obviously invited members of the uh, Glengevelin Sinn Féin Club to some fundraising activity or such, and Charles Dolan was responding with his regret, uh, with his regrets, as uh, he says they were holding a raffle and a dance that evening. Now, water damage at the bottom of the uh, letter uh, make parts of it difficult to read, but Dolan goes on to make a cryptic remark about what would Mr Rudd think of Mr Cullen the former secretary of the Glan Sinn Féin Club, going down to Oma a few days later to give his final bail. I'm not exactly sure what, what that's referring to, so it'll be interesting to see whether I can dig up some more information about that. Uh, Glan uh, was not in one of the, it was not in the West Cavern uh, 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 Brigade. They were uh, in the D Company of the 2nd Battalion of the Fermanagh Brigade, I suppose, because geographically it was probably easier. Because uh, if you notice in that map we saw a moment ago, the cutoff point uh, for the West Calvin Curler Brigade was uh, Glen Gap. So they obviously they're facing from Anna Glen rather than uh, uh, the rest of Calvin. This is a photograph of a uh, Ballycon Courthouse, which was born by the IRA on the 9th of May 1920. This is at a time when a lot of RIC barracks and courthouses were being destroyed. The courthouses in particular in order to divert court cases to the new arbitration in Sinn Féin courts that we just saw a moment ago. Uh, the RIC had been withdrawn from Ballyconnell Barracks on the 2nd of May 1920, so a week before uh, the courthouse was burned. Um, and then the barracks was burned uh, itself the following night on the 3rd of May 1920. The RIC in Swaddle and Bar would cycle into Ballyconnell on fair days and market days until the 1st of February 1921, when they took over a house and shop in the town belonging to a Miss Toomey. And this de facto barracks housed eight RIC men and eight black and tans until January 1922. The two men in the photograph were Willie Kelleher, who we'll meet again later on, and Frank Dolphin himself. <clears throat> And this is a report of uh, the destruction of Patrick Leonard's home and farm buildings on the night of the 19th of December 1920 by Crown Forces in reprisal for the killing of RIC Constable Peter Shannon two nights earlier on the 17th of December. Uh, there was an ambush and, and Shannon uh, was killed. Patrick Leonard himself was not implicated, but two of his sons uh, were on the run. And uh, this led the RIC to suspect their involvement in the ambush. Uh, and so it goes through in, in some detail what's going on here is in the parish of Canali. Uh, damage uh, to house, property and farm produce on the night of the 19th of December 1920. And uh, number one, dwelling house furniture, including beds and bedding, kitchen utensils destroyed. Uh, number two, offices, uh, houses, uh, including buyers, stables and fowl house destroyed. Number three, farm produce destroyed, 
30 tonnes of hay, one tonne of corn and one tonne of straw. And then number four, uh, the loss of crops uh, by two sons on the run are three acres of oats and two acres of potatoes. What they're saying there is uh, because the two lads were on the run, they weren't there to take in the crops and the crops um, uh, weren't weren't able to take them in. So that was a loss of earning as well as a result of that. Uh, this uh, The house being destroyed... Um, uh, left Patrick and his family and he had nine children and all left them homeless for Christmas that year the 19th of December was a bad night in Swan and Bar uh, as the creamery was also destroyed uh, by uh, uh, the Crown Forces as well uh, as you see there creamery destroyed uh, by fire caused by Crown Forces on the night of the 19th of December 1920, uh, 1921 that's actually a mistake it should be 1920 Some of these uh, reports were written after uh, the event, and so I think there was just uh, uh, the guy who, who wrote that uh, some years later just put down the wrong uh, year on it. And then this is uh, another, uh, the same uh, night again, the 19th of December 1920. Uh, this is a guy called Patrick Dolan who owned a pub, uh, and it's, it's a damage uh, to house property an owner, and there was two hundred and seventeen pounds of tea destroyed. Uh, there was um, uh, two uh, or one hundred weights, uh, two one hundred weights, and four stone of sugar destroyed. Twelve pounds of tobacco destroyed, taken away by Crown Forces on the night of the nineteenth of December. There was about thirty gallons of stout, sixty gallons of whiskey, ten gallons of. Not quite sure what that is. 25 gallons of ginger wine, 33 gallons of port wine, all destroyed. There was also window lamps and mirrors broken. And there were 72 pounds taken away on the same night by Crown Forces. So, you know, uh, the, it was a bad night for poor uh, Patrick Dolan. And then the final uh, report that we have of destruction of property that particular night is uh, a guy called Bernard Beacon who suffered uh, the loss of a corn mill, which was closed for six months, dating from the 22nd of December, so actually three nights later, the 22nd of December, 1920, uh, by order of the RIC. So, you know, it, 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 they, were, they were obviously out to cause as much kind of havoc as they could in Swanland Bar as a result of uh, the young Shannon RIC man uh, being killed. We go on again. Uh, the, some of these uh, reports, uh, they're they're not dated themselves, and it does look like some of them. We'll, we'll see later on. Some of them are uh, written up later on, and so there's a, quite a few of these uh, type of reports uh, which give the information uh, on uh, people who were uh, attacked or their property that was damaged, and these are listed later on. Uh, once things uh, kind of die down. And this is a fellow called Thomas Mullally, uh, who was from Bombay, and his motor car and lorry were dismantled on the 25th of February 1921. Uh, parts were received back on the 18th of July and taken again on the 4th of August and received again on the 6th of September. Uh, the house was raided and a watch was taken and some cash and a lamp were taken as well by Crown Forces. So this sort of thing has happened quite a lot. And... Um, uh, the, on this particular date uh, or uh, particular dates poor old Thomas Mullally uh, was at the uh, 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 the rough end of the stick I suppose and this is a memorial card for Michael Baxter who died on the 11th of March 1921 at the age of 24 at the Selton Hill ambush near Mohill in County Leitrim uh, Baxter was one of six men to die that day an incident which sent shockwaves through the Republican movement in Leitrim and which effectively ended uh, the IRA in the south of that county. Michael was from Bombay and had joined the Cavan Leitrim Railway in Ballinamore in 1914. Rising through, the, uh, rising through the ranks of the IRA, Michael went on the run in November 1920 before his death in March the following year uh, when a group of volunteers were fired upon by a large force of police and soldiers. <clears throat> Michael's mother later recalled how she and her daughter had to, quote his, take his remains out of an old shed and coffin him. The civil registration of his death records Michael as being only 21 years old, or being only 20 years old, but uh, records, so that's wrong, 
but records the cause of death as being uh, due to hemorrhage and shock from bullet wounds. Michael was buried at Kiln of Art following a huge funeral. And the Anglo-South described uh, the so great was the assemblage that their remains had reached the burying ground uh, before the last of the mournful procession had left the home about two miles away. There was a large muster of volunteers from different companies in West Cavan and County Leitrim. A force of military and police were present, but beyond scrutinising the reeds, did not interfere, perhaps wisely. <clears throat> this is a very difficult time for the Baxter family, as we're going to see here now, because again, this is one of these lists of um, uh, uh, actions that were taken against people. And this one gives uh, the uh, Charles Baxter, who was Michael's father, and his damage done during uh, during wars. And uh, so it gives his address there uh, uh, in Bombay. It says, one son and, uh, arrested and interned since January 1921. Uh, uh, that was, uh, I think, Patrick, who later became a TV and a senator. Uh, one son was shot. That was Michael on the March 11th. A daughter was arrested on the 2nd of February 1921 and in prison for a month. That was Kathleen uh, Baxter. And then another, go further on, another son on the run and no one to carry on the work. That's something that comes up quite in quite a few of these, that no one can do the farm work because they're all on the run. The young men are on the run. This particular lad who's on the run is uh, uh, Thomas is his name. Uh, and then it goes on to say the house was raided several times by Crown forces, some whiskey, fishing nets and um, uh, uh, other things were taken and not returned. So other instruments, I think it's, it's in, yeah, instruments, uh, he spelled it wrong, uh, were taken and not returned. So these are sort of lists uh, of, of the, of the you know, regular depredations that were carried out against certain people, particularly people uh, who had uh, kind of a Republican pedigree, as the Baxters undoubtedly did. Michael Kirby, who was a native of Tipperary Town, was in 1920 employed as an assistant county surveyor in West Cavan. Kirby lodged at the Dolphins Hotel, and on the night of the 26th of December 1920, the British military raided the hotel in search of Frank Dolphin, who at the time was on the run. When questioned, Kirby refused to delve the British forces where Frank was. He probably didn't know where he was anyway, resulting in Kirby's arrest and internment in Ballykinlar Prison Camp, County Down. And, and this slide and the next one are pages from a notebook that he kept uh, during his incarceration at Ballykinlar. Uh, the first image is a sketch of the camp in which Kirby was held. Uh, there are 38 huts, uh, there's barbed wire, there's sentries at each corner, there's a chapel, a canteen, a bathhouse, and a recreation area. Uh, a fellow prisoner, a guy called James Quigley, it looks like, signed Kirby's book on the 4th of June 1921, uh, inscribing the book Ad Multos Annos, meaning many happy returns. The next image uh, is a drawing signed by Michael Kirby and dated June 1921 in the bottom right corner there and it's of the type of bed the prisoners had to sleep on along with the humorous caption with his plank bed and blanket each shinner can swank it. Michael was released uh, from Ballykinlar in December 1921 so he was there for a year and he was back in Tipperary for Christmas so hopefully he had a more comfortable bed than that when he got home to Tip. Uh, this now is a list of activities uh, uh, carried out uh, by the Swanland Bar E Company of the Corlin Battalion between April 1920 and 11th of July 1921. And this is one of these ones that's compiled at a later, uh, at a later stage. And this was compiled by a guy called Joseph McGovern, who's from Main Street, Swanland Bar, in August 1937. So a good while afterwards. And this, this was done at the request of Frank Dolphin, who even at this point seems to have been very interested in piling as much information as he could about IRA activity in West Cavan. And the activities are shown as being there's drill parades, execution of court decisions, uh, raids on houses uh, of candidates about to join the RIC, uh, raids on a mail on mail cars in Fermanagh, uh, the ambush in Swanland Bar, which we mentioned a moment ago, um, uh, road trenchings, uh, arms raids, and the enforcement of the Belfast boycott, which decreed that people uh, don't buy any goods from Belfast as a result of the pogroms against Catholics uh, that were going on at the time uh, in, in Belfast. Uh, these two images uh, relate uh, to uh, the unveiling of a new headstone on the 11th of July 1950 
over the grave of Sean McIntyre, an IRA volunteer from Lagan and Kilturbet, who was killed by falling rubble on the 4th of June 1921 when attempting to blow up Tompkin Road House just outside Belturbet. It took a few days to recover Sean's remains and they did, uh, and they were recovered under cover of night uh, at, and were buried at Drumlane Abbey. Uh, the McIntyre family were not well off and they had to sell the family farm in the years following Sean's death. Again, because there was nobody to work the farm. He had an older brother uh, who had died, I think, of not, maybe of TB a few years previously. And he had he, he had his sister-in-law and a young nephew. And, and once Sean died, there was nobody to work the farm. So they ended up selling it. And, uh, it, and it wasn't until 1950 that a headstone felt to be fitting to Sean's stature in life and the manner of his death was placed over his grave. Before the unveiling took place, as you can see there on the on the uh, uh, poster, uh, a procession of bands led the attendees from Lanigan's Cross at 3 p.m. And that's uh, at the junction on the N87 between Belturbet and Ballyconnell, which turns into Milltown. Following that unveiling of the headstone, a graveside oration was given by Tom Barry, uh, the prominent uh, West Cork IRA leader. And the photograph on the right-hand side uh, shows uh, the headstone as it is today. The, and it's just outside the walls of, of the uh, Abbey Church uh, that, that still stand. It's just down from the Round Tower. And uh, this is, again, one of these reports on something, uh, on, on kind of incidents against uh, uh, people. And this was probably written after the well after the fact as well. And it's talking about a woman called Mrs. Brady, who's uh, from Bomboy. And the house was raided. The husband was arrested. He was interned uh, from June 1921. And he was the sole supporter of what is called a weak family of small children. So again, nobody would work the farm or support them in, in whatever way uh, needed, needed doing. And the next couple of images now uh, demonstrate just how strapped for supplies and money the West Cavan Brigade was uh, during uh, this this whole period. And uh, the first one here that I'm going to show you is a letter, which, again, some of these things have shown a wee bit of um, uh, fire damage uh, on them, but thankfully they survived. Um, and this uh, is from the ASU, the Active Service Unit of the Number 1 Battalion, requesting more funds from the quartermaster to pay for cigarettes, tobacco and plates and mugs which had been broken in transit uh, to their training camp. And that letter, I suppose, illustrates the mundanity of everyday life which continued even during this period. People needed their cigarettes, they needed their tobacco, they needed their, their cups and plates and mugs to have their tea and their food and so on. <clears throat> the next one is, is a, a list of weapons uh, that were held uh, by the H Company of that number one uh, battalion. And again, demonstrates just how chronic the need for weapons and supplies was uh, during this period. Um, I mean, if you just go through, like it's five bombs, three large and two small, 17 sporting guns, uh, five double barrel and 12 single, one German parabellum pistol with, with the spring broken, uh, 30 sticks of jet ignite and 40 fuses. And then the note on the bottom says, there is no ammunition for any of the guns as the ASU have taken it. So even with they have all these weapons, they don't have any ammunition for the guns. So the guns are useless in and of themselves. So, you know, this, this kind of very small operation was taken on the might of the British Empire. And it's an extraordinary thing, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that they were able to do so. Again, this is one of these uh, reports of robberies and things that happened to uh, different people. This is a guy called Patrick McGovern from Curla, And uh, uh, what happened to him was uh, his house was raided in the middle of June 1921 by RIC, Black and Tans and Specials. And the damage done was uh, one valuable gold watch was stolen. So that sort of thing, you know, is is uh, quite common. And again, you can see some of the fire damage uh, on that particular uh, report. This is William Kelleher. We met him a, a few uh, shots ago uh, when we were looking at the photograph. And uh, this this is a bill uh, that, that um, uh, to Ballyconnell uh, Sinn Féin, uh, given some idea of the supplies needed for the men, probably when they were going on training and different things, uh, or maybe they may have been on the run either. And some of the items include kind of food items like jam, sugar, loaves of bread, 
uh, as well as cigarettes and clothing and related items, including polish, shirts, socks, and drawers. They're they're paying. They're they've got three pairs of drawers uh, at three and six each. Uh, so a bargain. Uh, and uh, and then the the uh, these items were bought on the slate at William Kelleher's shop, and uh, over four days in July nineteen twenty one. So on the fifth, on the sixth, on the seventh, on the ninth. And then the little note on the bottom left says is dated the 15th of July, 21 and paid. So they owed £2.15 shillings and sevenpence. So that was uh, paid up. And then this is William Kelleher again. Uh, and again, it, it said he was raided as well. His premises was raided uh, in the middle of June 1921, again by the RIC, Black and Tans and the Specials. And there was a certain amount of, I think it says, a pair of new leather leggings uh, taken or stolen. Also, a quantity of butter, eggs and milk were destroyed. Very petty. Uh, and some money stolen as well. So uh, poor old William Keller, at least he was getting a bit of business from uh, from Sinn Féin. Uh, so hopefully that helped him along. Now, this is a really interesting one. This is a ticket uh, for, uh, for a draw in which the winner... The lucky winner would receive a one pound note, and uh, it was to be held in the market house in Ballyconnell on the eighteenth of September, nineteen twenty one, at half seven. And uh, tickets uh, were one shilling each, so you could um, multiply your uh, your outlay by twenty uh, if you if you were the lucky winner. But what's really interesting about this particular uh, ticket is on the back there's a list of RIC men and black and tans, uh, which isn't terribly clear now. Certainly the ones on the left aren't terribly clear who are the RIC, and uh, the ones on the right who are the black and tans are slightly more uh, uh, legible. Uh, but uh, on the left-hand side, I can see a Hardigan, a Shields, a Cassidy. On the other side, I see a Broderick, a Barr, um, maybe a Finley at the bottom, of, or two Tulin. Uh, could be maybe at the very bottom there. Uh, so again, it just shows we're going to be looking at uh, the next few slides. We're we'll looking at our observational reports, and the IRA were keeping a very, very close eye uh, on on RIC, on Black and Tans, on specials, and on anybody uh, who they felt was, you know, uh, acting in any sort of a suspicious manner. And this is one of these reports uh, taken in a week of activity in November uh, 1921. And it gives an insight, as I say, into how closely the British forces and the RIC were being watched in West Cavan during this period, even following the truce and the end of the War of Independence. It's written by the information uh, officer of the Sea Company, which takes in Bomboy, uh, and the action centres around the comings and goings to and from that particular village. Uh, activities such as lines being cut, suspected spying and lorry carrying a large group of men to a football match in Swad uh, are all noted. Uh, that, that last bit there um, is the last three lines. About two o'clock, a lorry from Ballyconnell direction uh, with about um, uh, 30 police on it went to Swad. It was a football match. It was to a football match. So these sort of things um, are going on, you know, and, and it just gives an awful lot of information as to what's going on. Um, they're, they're talking about Dean Finley's house there as well. Uh, uh, there was uh, lines cut there by the specials from Brackley. And there's all sorts of information. These these are really fascinating uh, things. This is another one uh, from Swan and Bar, dated the 3rd of November, 1921. And uh, they say uh, that uh, five police attend mass at half eight. Uh, on the th on the third of July, and at ten twenty five, a cycle patrol consisting of one sergeant and two constables went out the Bond Road and returned at one o'clock. A black and tan went a uh, Bond Road in plain clothes, cycling at ten past twelve. Even though he was in plain clothes, they knew he was a black and tan. Uh, two police on duty at ten to twelve went the Enniskillen Road. Uh, patrol at four o'clock, Bond Road returned at six o'clock. Patrol at 20 to 10 in Skillen Road uh, returned at 10.15. So they're keeping very, very close uh, eye on these people. Here's one from Beltorbet, uh, dating uh, from December 1921. And uh, it's quite a long letter. It fills four pages, this one. But it notes how army cadets are coming into town and collecting papers and letters. But generally states how relatively quiet uh, things are. As he says there on the Tuesday, nothing worth noting today. Uh, but then on the Wednesday, 
uh, they're talking about specials, uh, very busy today, seem to have something on, and he names a number of people uh, who are living in the town. Uh, there's a number of girls also noted to be spending a lot of time with black and tans, and one of these girls is said to be out all hours with them. Um, on, on, on the Thursday of the week that they're talking about, a lorry load of black and tans and Swan and Bar got out of Beltorbet, and as the report goes, went about the town, in and out of the public houses, for three hours. Uh, and it gives, again, a great idea uh, of how closely uh, British forces are being watched and also those who are suspected of colluding with them as well. Again, this is uh, 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 th this is a report of a raid. This is a really interesting one. It's a report of a raid on a dance which has been held in the Hibernian Hall on the 16th of October, 1921. And what's unusual about this incident is uh, that it's not Crown forces who are responsible for the raid, rather it is five civilians. And this happens on, uh, as I say, the 16th of October, uh, and it happens around 11 o'clock p.m. Five armed, disguised men entered and held up the crowd. Uh, they demanded the money made on the door, which was not produced. They then inquired who was in charge of the money. When they were told, they took the two boys outside, searched them, and took five shillings from one of them, all he had about him, uh, before leaving. Uh, they fired three shots and gave them half an hour to clear out, saying they would return, uh, which, uh, which threat they did not carry out. They also abused uh, three volunteers, which they met on the road. It's believed it was some of themselves was at the raiding. So it, it's an interesting one that, you know, the, uh, it, it wasn't just the RIC or the Black Tans who were causing trouble. Sometimes uh, uh, hostile civilians. As as the letter is noted, uh, were to were to blame for these things, and this is is another one of these observational reports signed the twenty third of December nineteen twenty one, and it says a motor a motor bicycle, uh, uh, with a black and tan cycled cycled through Bombay uh, at eleven a.m. towards Swan Bar from Ballyconnell. At eleven fifteen, the same bicycle returned towards Ballyconnell. At 12 o'clock, a car, and then it gives the number. The number is 1K2425, containing about four black and tans towards Ballycon. So it's given just extraordinary levels of detail as to what's uh, going on at the time. This is a, an interesting letter as well from a guy called Owen Tumelty, who is the secretary of the Swan and Bar Sinn Féin Club, again to Frank Dolphin, who, as I said earlier, was also the secretary of the Ballyconnell Club, and it's dated 29th of December 1921. And the letter contains a request that Ballyconnell Sinn Féin Club hold a dance in aid of a man from Swan and Bar, uh, whose son was on the run following the attack on the RIC in Swan and Bar in December 1920, where this man's home was raided, as was the Leonard house that we saw earlier on. <clears throat> Excuse me. They dragged him out of the house and beat him unconscious. And his injuries were so severe that he was hospitalised in Dublin for a month. And this man, unsurprisingly, maybe, brought a court case against the RIC, but also, perhaps unsurprisingly, lost that case, uh, leaving him with crippling costs. And obviously, the, the feeling was that this man had a very deserving cause and a very deserving case, but that the British forces had conspired against them. And pleading his case, uh, the Swan and Bar Sinn Féin requested Ballyhon's aid and fundraising for him. And that was quite common at the time. And there are a few letters in the Dolphin Archive of this nature. And we saw the letter that came from Glan saying, oh, sorry, we can't uh, attend your function because we're having them as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is, again, another one of these a list of, of items bought for a training camp and they were bought in A. McBride, McBride and Ballyconnell. They bought breeches and leggings. They bought two pairs of boots and uh, that came to £2.19 shillings and ninepence. And then to Miss Toomey, whose, whose shop was later taken over, as we saw earlier, uh, by the RIC, they bought of her one pair of breeches and leggings, uh, which was slightly dearer uh, than the ones he could buy in McBride's. Uh, and then they also bought of a guy called McGovern and Curla, one pair of boots for a pound. And then uh, T. Riley of Bombay, they bought a pair of boots as well for a pound. And that all came to six pounds, seven shillings and nine pence. So again, just gives you the idea of the things that were required uh, by uh, by these uh, various battalions. <clears throat> and this is, is such an extraordinary uh, survival, really. And it, it pinpoints such a pivotal, seminal moment 
in Irish history. This is a telegram from a guy called Morris Collins to Frank Dolphin, dated the 7th of January 1922, informing Frank of the results on the vote taken by Dáil Éireann on the Anglo-Irish Treaty between Great Britain and Ireland, which had been signed on the 6th of December 1921. Once that treaty was signed, it had to be ratified for, uh, by the Dáil, so it was ratified uh, after Christmas. And the vote, as you can see, uh, 64 to 57, was a close run thing. And it was supported, uh, the Ballycon and Sinn Féin supported the treaty, uh, and in December 1921, after the treaty had been signed, before it had been ratified, uh, they sent a telegram to Peter Paul Galligan, uh, the local TD, asking him to vote for the treaty. And the reason they asked him to vote for the treaty uh, was for what they called the resulting peace in Ireland and the release of prisoners, uh, which would follow. And uh, he did vote for it, and the prisoners were released. Um. This next one then is is a drill report uh, from uh, February 1922, and it covered uh, the previous fortnight. And many of these drills for the West Cavan Brigade were held in the workhouse grounds of Bomboy or at Templeport Hall. And uh, as you may be able to see it too clearly there, but there are a number of absences in the second week due to illness. And a note at the bottom of the page states that the company held no parades last week owing to the most of the company being sick with influenza. And given that the Spanish flu pandemic had occurred only a few years previously, that would have been a real fear among people in 1922. Uh, they wouldn't have wanted to uh, go out and spread that sort of thing around or get ill themselves or get even more ill themselves. Uh, and this, this is another, you can see things are getting slightly more official, head and paper and different things. Uh, and once the Irish Free State was established, in uh, early 1922, the new nation had to then look to its own self-governance. And accordingly, this statement, which is uh, dated the 1st of February 1922 and signed by the Chief of Police on West Cav Brigade had no paper, <clears throat> excuse me, informed licensed traders of the hours permitted for the selling of alcohol, with no alcohol at all to be sold on a Sunday, except to what they say are bona fide travellers. So if someone was travelling from A to B and they were stopping over for the night, you could serve them alcohol. That was it. And this is another one of these reports uh, of of uh, uh, people who had been attacked and, and so on. And this it, it's undated, this claim, but it's it's uh, by a guy called Thomas McGovern, one boy, for compensation for his car, which had been commandeered uh, on the 13th of June, 1921. The car was returned on the 8th of October that year, and Thomas requested £2 for day and £20 for other damages. Now, it's not known whether this was paid. That would have made a sizable amount of money. And it's further noted that the permit for the car was confiscated by the RIC in February 1921 and presumably not returned. So a replacement for that uh, was required also. And then they also mention uh, at the bottom uh, of the report uh, the destruction of the Sinn Féin O'Rahilly Hall in Curla by Crown Forces on the 26th of December 1920. Um, the police and military were busy that evening. They were searching for Frank Dolphin that same night. They were arresting Michael Kirby, who we mentioned a moment ago. And that hall had only been built in 1919, so it wasn't there for too long. And the final image that I'm going to look at is... Um, Another one of these observational reports from 1921. Uh, the month is obscured. We ca I can't just see what the month is uh, because of fire damage at the very top. Uh, but it might be September. I was looking at it closely. It might be, but it's not really, I can't really say. But the writer notes that there are about 20 of what he terms the enemy in SWAD. There are nine black and tans, there's 10 RAC, and there's a detective inspector all living in the barracks, except the detective inspector and two sergeants who are living in private accommodation, and what they call private accommodation. The detective inspector was staying in the local spa hotel, and of course, Swan Bar was very well known for its spa waters and things, and so this was the local spa hotel. Another sergeant was away on leave, but he normally was uh, staying in private accommodation as well. And so again, the level of detail is really quite extraordinary. Uh, and the highlighted note at the bottom of the page states that there is no hotel porter. So they're highlighting that. So in other words, if you want to get in and uh, you know get at some of these guys, there's no porter at the door to stop you or to warn people or so on. There's quite a chilling sort of uh, a, a little note to highlight at the very end. So that that's really a, a quick run through some of this material uh, that has been collected 
by Frank Dolphin and then very carefully curated uh, by his son Frankie and very generously donated uh, to the uh, Cavan Library Service. Um, there's, as I said, there's going to be uh, an exhibition uh, in uh, uh, later on this year uh, on this material, and uh, people will be welcome to come along and see some of this. Uh, it's one of the richest archives on a local level that I've ever seen, and we're really, really lucky to have it. It gives us such uh, an idea of what was going on on the ground in that whole area of West Cavan. And uh, so I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much.